have you ever felt? Are you listening? And welcome back to Mr. Miller's Classroom Channel and our next online edition of Notes for U.S. History. And today we are going to be talking about the Cold War. So let's get to it, eh? Here's our background picture today. And uh, you can see on each side... Uh, there is a multitude of bombs, a Y-bomb, a Z-bomb, a Y-rocket, an H-bomb. And hanging over those bombs, it says, on no account to be used because the enemy might retaliate. And both sides have uh, the same thing. And um, basically, this represents the conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union during the period of what we would call the Cold War. And the Cold War lasted from the end of World War II, around 1945, until the early 1990s, about 1991, when the Soviet Union dissolved. And what happened was we both built up our weapons so uh, such a level that we could never use them against each other because we would just have killed each other completely and also hurt many of the you know, people on the planet, the majority of the people on the planet. So they say, oh, we can't use the bombs that we developed. We have to instead go back to using bow and arrows again. And today we're going to focus on the Cold War abroad, obviously. We're going to focus on the conflict between the United States and our allies and the Soviet Union and their allies. And this is the war of words and sometimes weapons between the U.S. and the USSR, created by yours truly, Mr. Miller. Before we get into the conflict, we have to do a little background work here. And what we're going to do is talk about capitalism and communism. And there's some basic fundamental differences between the United States and the USSR, which made it difficult for us to get along. The Soviet economic system of communism called for government ownership of the means of production and centralized decision making. And here you can see communism, it's a party, maybe not a great party but still a party and it's a play on words you know like the communist party and here you see famous people in the history of communism um of course we have stalin from the soviet union lenin from the soviet union fidel castro who's still alive actually in cuba uh then you have uh mao from china and then Marx, uh, Karl Marx, who was the first guy to come up with the idea of communism. That's why he has a lampshade on his head. And this is, communism is different because the government control everything. Uh, but in the U.S., we don't practice communism. We practice capitalism. And capitalism is the use of a free market economy, which is based on private ownership, of the means of production, free markets, and individual freedom. And to emphasize this point, we're going to go and watch a little video here first. It's called 1947, The Year of Division, which shows the differences between capitalism and communism. was the growing struggle between two great powers to shape the post-war world. Soviet Russia was expensively stabbing westward, knifing into nations left empty by war. On orders from the Kremlin, Russia had launched one of history's most drastic political, moral, and economic wars, a Cold War. The United States was obliged to help Europe safeguard its traditional freedoms and the independence of its nations. 
was the spirit of wartime unity that reached its peak on that historic afternoon in April 45 at the Elbe River in Germany. Here, two worlds actually met, but this coalition was to be torn asunder. Already an iron curtain had dropped around Poland, Hungary, Yugoslavia, Bulgaria. Ah, but this is Europe, you say. But let's see what can happen elsewhere in, say, the small town of Mortsonay, Wisconsin. Peaceful, isn't it? But the red truncheon falls and the chief of police is hustled off to jail. Next, public utilities are seized by Pip's colonists. Watch carefully what happens to an editor who operates under a free press. He goes to jail, too, and his newspaper is confiscated. Exit freedom of thought. Yes, this is life under the Soviet form of government. The little town of Mothany made this experiment for 24 hours, a public service to all America. It can't happen here? Well, this is what it looks like if it should. call it quits there for that video but um just want to show you how that worked basically um of course that was more propaganda from the 1940s late 1940s um and it was a combination of propaganda films and newsreels and that clip um from a, a larger movie called the atomic cafe and in, in that movie, it shows a bunch of different ideas about propaganda and anti-communist feeling in the United States during that time. And you can see that they're trying to emphasize the differences between communism and capitalism. Communism, central controlled government, uh, control of the economy, capitalism, free market economy based on private ownership. And again, we're based, again, this is us, this is capitalism. I want you to buy crap, a, a play on the famous uh, Mo James Montgomery flag poster, I want you for the U.S. Army. Instead, he wants you to buy Coca-Cola and FUBU and Burger King and Ford and McDonald's and Nike and Pizza Hut and all those different, you know, products that we can get in the United States. There's also differences in political organization between the United States and the Soviet Union. And one of those differences is that the United States, the United States people elect their leaders from differing political parties, and we practice democracy. In the Soviet Union, there was a totalitarian government, which was created by the Communist Party and allowed no opposition. At the top of the Communist Party was a dictator like Lenin, Stalin, or Khrushchev. And here you can see some cartoon drawings of those guys. Three leaders of the USSR from left to right, Vladimir Lenin, Joseph Stalin, and Nikita Khrushchev. Okay, here we are going to talk about some times where the disagreement between the Soviet Union and the United States became public. And the first places these happened, these disagreements happened, were at Yalta and Potsdam uh, during World War II, at the end of World War II. And the first disagreement came at the Yalta Conference in February of 1945. Uh, Joseph Stalin favored a harsh approach towards Germany, and he wanted to divide it into occupation zones so that it couldn't threaten the USSR again. Churchill disagreed, and the U.S. President FDR, they were both against these actions. They figured that, hey, you know, being so strict towards Germany didn't really work during after World War I. They came back with a vengeance, and then we had World War II, which was pretty bad. So not a good idea, Stalin. So a compromise was agreed upon. Germany would be split into four zones, one French, one British, one American, and one Soviet zone. And Stalin promised free elections in Poland and other areas occupied by the Soviets during the war in return. And here you can see a, a map. Uh, of Germany and how it would be divided and you can see the green here represents the British territory the blue represents the French territory the orange represents the US territory and the red represents the Soviet territory and with 
embedded in the Soviet territory is the city of Berlin. You can also see that it's multicolored, and, and that's very significant. And we'll talk about Berlin in a little bit. Here's a picture of the big three, uh, the original big three, Churchill, FDR, and Stalin from left to right. So that's at Yalta. Another disagreement came at Potsdam, and this would be in July and August of 1945. And the big three, as they were, got split up, mixed up, because uh, FDR died, and he was replaced by Harry S. Truman, and Churchill lost an election. His party lost an election, so he was ousted by a guy named Clement Attlee. So the only original member of the big three that remained was Stalin, again, Stalin, Joseph Stalin of the Soviet Union, was the only member of the Big Three that remained in the Potsdam Conference. Um, Stalin had broken his promise concerning free elections in USSR-controlled territory, such as Poland, as you mentioned earlier, and this made Truman pretty angry. And it had been agreed to at Yalta that the Allies would take reparations from Germany, but Truman disagreed with this at Potsdam, so he didn't agree with what FDR had originally agreed upon. Stalin pushed Truman to give in, but eventually had to settle for reparations from only his occupied area of Germany. And that's a key point there. Stalin could get reparations, but only from that red area I showed you briefly on that map. And here's the new big three. Again, Clement Attlee on the left, Truman in the middle, Stalin on the right. And Stalin was the only one of the original big three remaining by that point. And so, uh, the war ends in August of 1945, and at that point, we like to say the Iron Curtain falls. Don't, don't want to go quite that far yet. I want to go back here. Now, in March of 1946, Churchill described Europe by saying that it was as if an Iron Curtain had fallen across and separated the cotton, continent. In Western Europe, the nations were generally allied with the U.S., so in the West, it was the United States. But in Eastern Europe, the nations were generally allied with the USSR, so there was a division. Um, let's go back even further so we can see that thing there. So you can see here, this is a cartoon which represents the division between the two. And here's Churchill lifting up the Iron Curtain, uh, which says, No admittance by order of Joe, and there is no... Uh, trains going in, no people going in, maybe some people jumping over and, and trying to get out. And Churchill's kind of lifting it up and looking under it. And you know that's Churchill because he's bald and he's smoking a cigar, which was one of Winston Churchill's, you know, trademark things he did. Here we see um, the physical Iron Curtain, the green line here, um, separating Eastern Europe and Western Europe. And you can see that Germany was a country that was split down the middle here. We have Eastern Germany and Western Germany. And so um, this is a division. Now, it's not always a wall. It's not like a huge wall was built here. In some places, it was a physical boundary. But in most places, it was open territory. But it was patrolled, and people were just, you know, discouraged from going across it. That's why it was called the Iron Curtain. Stalin would strengthen his grip on Eastern Europe. He set up communist governments in these nations, and they became satellites of the USSR. And these countries included Poland, Hungary, Romania, and East Germany. And they served, you know, a purpose. They, they served as a, a military buffer between the Soviet Union and the, uh, the West, the Western uh, allied United States countries. And it, these countries like Poland, Hungary, Romania, East Germany, they could stop um, serve as a buffer and stop any invasion that the West might undertake in the future. So, President Truman, how did he respond to this Iron Curtain and, and Stalin and Soviet Union strengthening their control over these countries? He adopted something called the Truman Doctrine. What did the Truman Doctrine do? Well, it called for the United States to aid groups which were resisting communist infiltration. It called on the U.S. to practice containment, and by doing so, the U.S. would prevent the extension of communism to other countries. So the idea of containment is you contain communism where it is. You don't let it get any farther. And that's Truman's goal there. And the first countries that benefited from the Truman Doctrine were Turkey and Greece. 
Um, and they were trying to prevent a communist takeover in their countries, and they received over $400 million from the United States to do so. Other countries in Western Europe would also benefit from the U.S. aid through something called the Marshall Plan. And uh, this was uh, put in effect in 1951. And the idea was, hey, Europe's been destroyed through war. Uh, the people are in a weak, impressionable state there. We don't want communism influencing them, so we're going to give money to help rebuild them. And that way they'll be see the United States as a friend and be more prone to uh, giving into our ideas and, and liking our ideas about capitalism and, and democracy. And so we gave $13 billion to 16 different countries. Why is it called the Marshall Plan? Uh, here's why. It was made by U.S. Secretary of State George Marshall. Uh, former general. He was the creator of the Marshall Plan. And you can see here what countries got aid. Um, and they're mostly Western European countries that got aid, especially like uh, Great Britain and France, Western Germany. They were the top receivers of aid there. But a lot of other countries like Italy, Switzerland, Austria, um, Belgium, the Netherlands, Norway, Sweden, Denmark. Uh, Ireland, Iceland, Portugal, Greece, and Turkey received money through the Marshall Plan. That's a very important point. And you can see the countries that didn't receive it were the Eastern European countries, which were controlled by the Soviets. The Soviets discouraged them from accepting any aid. So when did the words actually become actions? This happened at the Berlin blockade. Let me go back here for a second. Don't want to see that map yet. In 1948, the U.S., France, and Great Britain combined their three occupied zones of Germany into one nation, and this became Western Germany. But one piece of their territory was in jeopardy, and this was Western Berlin. It was surrounded by Soviet territory. Stalin wanted to bring all of Western Berlin under his control, under Soviet control. So he shut down all highways and railroads into the city and attempted to starve West Berlin into submission. Here we can see West Berlin. It's a very precarious situation. There's East Berlin, there's West Berlin, um, and again, all of West Berlin is surrounded by Soviet territory. And this is, you know, it, it just, it, it's inconvenient for Stalin. It, it's, it's a weakness in the Soviet-controlled areas. You'd have this one free uh, half of the city just sitting there people can go and see how the people in the West benefit from capitalism and free enterprise. And he doesn't like that. So again, shut down all the roads, shut down all the railroads, starve them out, make them, uh, may force them to become communist. Here's one point that's important we'll talk about in a second is Checkpoint Charlie. And Checkpoint Charlie was a, you know, a gateway between the two cities, uh, East Berlin and West Berlin. The two halves of the city, I should say. We'll talk more about Checkpoint Charlie in a little bit. But this Berlin blockade, again, was designed to starve West Berlin into submission. What did the U.S. and Great Britain do? Well, they responded by flying food and supplies into the city. And this became known as the Berlin Airlift. And this action lasted from June 1948 until May 1949. Not quite a year, almost a year. Brought 2.3 million tons of supplies into the city. And eventually, the USSR gave in and opened up the roads. Now, I want to show you a quick video here. Let's go show taskbar. History. I'm going to go Cold War resources. And I'm going to go the candy bomber. And again, the U.S. and Great Britain flew supplies in, and some of those supplies took a, you know, more friendly form uh, through the candy bomber. Let's see what he, the candy bomber did. Uh -oh. Retired Air Force Colonel Gail Halverson drops candy to children from a C-54 transport plane. He does this at air shows around the United States, like this one at Andrews Air Force Base in Maryland. For 60 years, he's been known as the Candy Bomber. We fly this uh, Spirit of Freedom, the C-54, that supported the airlift, the 1940 and 49 air shows. 
all over the East Coast and we, to remind old people what it was about and uh, educate the young people of America what freedom meant to the kids in Berlin. In 1948, Halverson was in the Berlin Airlift. It was one of the largest humanitarian missions in history and it ended a confrontation between the United States and the Soviet Union. After World War II, a divided Berlin was surrounded by Soviet-occupied Eastern Germany. In May 1948, the Soviet Union blocked U.S., British, and French access to the western part of the city, hoping the Allies would abandon it. The two million people of West Berlin had only 35 days' worth of food. On June 26th, the U.S. and Britain began flying food, coal, and other vital supplies to them. Halverson is one of the best-known pilots of the airlift. He became known as the Candy Bomber because he dropped chocolate bars tied to small parachutes to the children of West Berlin. Halverson recalls that the idea for a candy drop came to him as he was talking with children across a barbed wire fence at a Berlin airport. I want to give them something because they didn't beg. I had two sticks of gum broken in half, four pieces through the barbed wire. Kids with a half a stick look like you got a million bucks. One child who was grateful was Helga Stega. Now Helga Johnson, she remembers living in a partially bombed out apartment building in post-war Berlin. We had really had nothing to eat. There was nothing available. We had some, some maybe some old potatoes or something, and uh, we were hungry all the time. We went to bed dressed because we had no coal to heat the house. Some of the windows were broken. She describes the feeling when she heard American and British planes landing. We were so grateful to the Americans that they helped us. And, we, you know, you have to remember, they were, we were the enemy. And the war was only over three years. And then the Americans helped us to stay alive. Helga, now a U.S. citizen, also travels to air shows on the restored transport plane that flew during the airlift. It serves as a traveling museum. Washington's International Spy Museum also has an exhibit on Berlin during the Cold War. The executive director Peter Ernest is a former CIA agent. He says the Berlin airlift altered the course of the Cold War. It was just that the blockade was so dramatic, so sudden, and provoked such a sharp reply that it clearly sharpened the formation of those, those opposing blocks, if you will. And in that sense, I think... Uh, it played a key role in the Cold War. Halverson says the Berlin airlift stopped Soviet leader Joseph Stalin from marching westward. He had to take West Berlin before he went to West Germany. He got stopped in West Berlin by world opinion because he was starving people and the British, French and Americans were feeding them. The Soviets ended their blockade in May 1949. The airlift, 278,000 flights, ended in September. Alverson says he and the others who flew in the airlift earned their place in history. Kent Klein, VOA News, Washington. Okay, and so that was one man who participated in the Berlin airlift. He was the candy bomber. Again, the Soviets were seen as starving people. Americans, French and British were feeding people. So eventually the USSR had to give in because the world outcry became too much. Here is an example of the flight patterns. Uh, that the British uh, and the French took, and the British and the French and the Americans took, to reach uh, West Berlin. And here's a picture of one of the planes flying over. And here's a, it was actually made into a stamp. The Berlin airlift delivers food and fuel in the 1948-49 blockade. And following the crisis, both Western Europe and Eastern Europe decided that we need to create military alliances because this. Uh, if it came down to a fighting, we need to make sure that we have each other's back. Twelve nations in the West, including Canada and the United States, formed the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. This was NATO in 1949. Eight nations from the East, including the USSR, formed the Warsaw Pact in 1955. So you have NATO uh, in Western Europe, the Warsaw Pact in Eastern Europe. And again, if one country in these organizations are atta is attacked, then the rest of the countries have to come to its aid. And that's all for this part of the Cold War Abroad video. Um, next, we're gonna be taking a look at the Korean War. I should have that video uploaded soon if I don't already have it done. So uh, just wait, or you can begin doing it right now. Uh, so that's all from Mr. Miller's uh, classroom videos for now. Peace out.